Hello, everyone. This is the KubeCon session, Policy Matters. Why, what, and how of Kubernetes policy management. We've got uh, Jaya Ramanathan, Radha Chital, and Jim Bhagwadia with us today to talk about all things policy. Uh, why don't we start with some brief in introductions, Radha? Good afternoon, all. My name is Radha Chital. I manage the cloud security team at TIA. Uh, and also I'm the co-chair for CNCF uh, Technical Advisory Group. Thank you, Jaya. Thanks, Aradhanam. Hi, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Jaya Ramanathan. I am um, a distribution engineer at Red Hat and uh, focused on security and governance. Uh, really excited to be here because uh, this policy management is one of my uh, passion topics at this point. Over to you, Jim. Hey, everyone. This is Jim Baguadia, co-founder and CEO at Nirmata, and I'm also a maintainer on Kiverno. Hi, and I'm Robert Ficalia. I'm a policy workgroup co-chair, also a volunteer with the CNCF security tag, and a CTO at Sunstone. So uh, the policy workgroup, uh, we are focused on all things policy, but specifically looking at Kubernetes policy itself and how uh, Kubernetes operators can use policy as code. We have two current projects, uh, but before we talk about that, just some infrastructure logistics. We meet every other Wednesday, 8 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we have our own Slack channel, and here's a link to our GitHub repository where we have some of the prototypes uh, Jim's going to talk about next. Yeah, so one of the efforts and initiatives we're you know, leading at the, in the policy working group is creating a common way of reporting policy reports, right? So one thing we found is as, as Kubernetes policies become increasingly important for production deployments, there are several policy tools and different tools have different languages, uh, perhaps different features, but what seemed to be missing and something which we felt could be common is a way of reporting results from these policy engines. So the policy report CRD is that effort and working with the community, we have now several tools uh, like Kiverno, uh, KubeBench, Falco and others supporting the policy report. Uh, there's more you know, integrations and adapters in progress uh, and we continue to sort of expand um, all, you know, the outreach and projects that can work with the policy report. Yeah, and we're absolutely looking for, for more projects to in, in, incorporate into the, uh, the policy report CRD process. So Jaya, maybe you, we, we've been working on this policy white paper for now for, for a little bit of time. Uh, maybe you could give us a brief intro on, on the what and hows that we've been discussing in this white paper. Yeah, th thank you, Robert. Um, one of the things uh, we, we have been discussing within the work group is, you know, as customers are transforming to adopt cloud, they still need to meet uh, security requirements, regulatory compliance requirements, et cetera, right? So they need to make sure that the cloud is configured properly for various controls. And uh, the SREs that are managing the clouds are not necessarily the experts in all the aspects. So this is where policy management comes into play, where the best practices are represented as policies and used to make sure that the controls are configured properly. So we wanted to kind of put together uh, overall uh, best practices for policy management that covers, you know, what the goals, the overall architecture, as well as uh, how a customer can go about uh, implementing this approach. So that's really what this white paper is about. It's conceptual. And uh, we plan to then have an addendum that uh, references some existing open source technologies uh, on implementing the concepts outlined here. So we definitely uh, welcome participation from the broader community to help us progress this further. Back okay. to you, Rosa. Yeah, so, well, let's jump right into it then and, and have the panel talk about the whys and, and some of the details behind uh, how you should manage policy and community. So Aradna, let me throw this to you first. The why, why should we care about policies? DevOps operators, Kubernetes cluster operators, why can't I just deploy containers and forget about policy? So Robert, um, the misnomer in the industry is that containers are secure by default, which is not the case as we have seen from a number of breaches that have happened in the industry. The attack surface is just too wide. 
infrastructure threats, operating system threats, um, you know, a network isolation threats, uh, software supply chain security threats. Um, so if you look at the CNCF landscape, there are a number of tools and technologies which are provided there that are used to build all this um, container platforms as well as the CICD pipelines. Um, the complexity of integration of all these tools into the deployment pipelines is tremendous. So to improve the developer experience, provide them a frictionless way to go deploy these containers in runtime, um, I think it's really important to start thinking security policy as code. And that is what this working group has been working on, defining what are those security controls and how can they be built into security policies that can be deployed at different stages of a platform so developers have a frictionless deployment experience and yet it is secure from the start and in the runtime as well. So great point. I, mean, I want to come back to the, the mapping, not to the, the how, but before I did one more why question to Jim. So why we have some KubeBench and we have things like CIS, mm -hmm. why is that not enough? Right. Yeah, so when you think about Kubernetes, of course, Kubernetes doesn't exist in isolation. It builds on top of um, many layers, like, of course, the cloud. Uh, or your infrastructure, if you're, you know, running uh, things on-prem or within a data center, um, and of course within Kubernetes, there's also several components. There's several different roles, right? So things like CIS benchmarks, tools like Kubebench, which you know manage CIS benchmarks, address one specific layer of that. But one of the things we detail in the in the white paper, and of course, which is also very important in practice is you really need to think about the cluster, the containers and the containerized workloads. You need to think about you know, the different roles interacting with Kubernetes and use policies as a contract uh, across these roles, right? So the, the, yeah, the, the, the sort of key takeaway there is making sure that every layer in the stack is, is covered, uh, including the containerized workloads application, the declarative configurations in Kubernetes, which can also be managed as code. So, so just to jump back quickly, Radna, to what you were saying, how, how do you accomplish all that complexity and map it back to security? How, how can you do that in a real world, you know, always changing Kubernetes environment? What, what have you seen out in the real world? So in the real world, um, obviously all these security controls that can mitigate the threats, um, obviously you have to do a threat model. Um, and based on that threat model, you know what your attack surface is and you want to minimize your attack surface and define what are those security controls which will mitigate specific threats and then convert them into security policies. Obviously you need a policy administration point where you can define all those policies and then also policy enforcement points at different places, uh, including the CICD pipelines where you have admission controllers which can validate various metadata elements from the incoming um, deployment, uh, con deployment of containers and services. And based on the policies, they may allow them to go deploy or may not allow them to deploy based on all the policy requirements that have been set up by the security and compliance teams to reduce the attack service ultimately. And same thing can be done in runtime as well. Uh, there, there can be runtime security controls which look for continuous uh, you know, um, validation of the images running. You can have a totally different image in the CICD pipeline and what is actually running in production could be totally different. So image programs, um, container breakouts and several other threats in runtime can be enforced through policy as well. And Jaya, what, what do you see out there in the field? What are these kind of the key security uh, implementations that, that move the needle? Yeah, I think um, what I'm seeing is uh, customers are driven by um, enterprise security requirements, meeting those standards, as well as the regulatory compliance requirements, right? Uh, whether it is, depending upon the industry they are in, whether it's PCI or HIPAA or FISMA, et cetera, right? So, and what they want is, and they have to go through so many audits and some of them, you know, have to have to be done annually, right? So that is really the pain point and um, that extends, obviously they've been doing this for traditional IT and now for cloud, they have to deal with the same issues, right? So what I'm finding is that customers are resorting to policy management more as a way to manage configuration 
because if you look at the end at the end of the day right if you if you take a particular compliance standard and then you look at a control in that standard and then you're implementing that control using a technology you need to make sure that that te technology for that control is configured properly so it's really a configuration management problem because you have a desired configuration state which is based on best practices like for example using tls 1.3 or using strong ciphers etc right and you are essentially defining policies to ensure that those configurations are set up properly, right? And imagine if you are able to accomplish that desired configuration straight for every control at every layer of your software stack through all the life cycles, CI, CD, runtime, et cetera, right? That's kind of the ideal vision, right? If I can accomplish that, then I'm continuously security ready, I'm continuously audit ready. Right? So that's really the eventual goal of policy management. And what I'm seeing customers doing is they are starting to scratch the surface. They are definitely uh, looking at uh, things that they are automating today using whatever homegrown scripts and so on. They are now converting those into policies and applying policy management techniques to those as the first step. And then, then taking it to the next level saying, okay, now I'm using this particular vendor for implementing this security control. Now they're telling those vendors can you now implement best practices for your technology as policies and give it to me, right? That's what um, customers are doing. So I, I think I'm seeing, I'm very hopeful. I'm seeing a lot of progress in this space. So I feel like the time has come to kind of realize this vision. And Jim, just to talk to that vendor perspective, because as a, uh, an implementer of a policy engine, you're seeing where customer needs meet the technology needs. So uh, what are you seeing as those, those key asks from the, the community right. and, and the, the larger Kubernetes operator? Yeah, yeah, so, so policies, you know, like Jaya was uh, very well articulating, it, certainly it fits within the configuration management realm of Kubernetes and other systems. There's also, you know, when you think about policies, typically people think about governance and compliance, those type of security realms as well, right? But when applying that, policies can also be used for automation, for reducing friction, reducing handoffs across different roles like developers, operators that are concerned with Kubernetes, right? So one of the things that was especially what we see uh, as very important, one of the reasons why we been, built Kiverno and are looking at you know, doing things in a very Kubernetes native manner is to make sure that the operations team is very comfortable implementing, managing, extending those policies and using DevOps best practices to policies as well, right? So not treating it as a foreign realm, but some, somehow some central team does separately, but making it part of the infrastructure as code um, and other DevOps best practices itself. And Narada, what is your experience and how do you realize that, that policy maintenance life cycle? What does that really look like as, as folks get kind of beyond the simple, you know, here's how I define my policy document. The, I, I, what, what challenges do they, do they see when trying to maintain that over time and, and, and over clusters? Um. Obviously, uh, security controls means uh, that you have to convert them into policies and security controls change based on the landscape, right? Threat landscape, <clears throat> sorry. Based on the threat landscape, the security controls will change and the policies are updated. But then the developer community has to be aware of those policies and controls because their deployments may fail based on a new control. So the communication is very important to the development community about the new threats and the controls that are going to be implemented. At the same time, um, enforcement points uh, have to be, uh, the integration with the enforcement points and decision points have to be made as well. And then obviously validation of the policies that they are not in conflict with each other. At the same time, thinking of policies as hierarchy is important, right? There could be some global policies that apply to everything. And then there could be regional or you know, deployment, a particular application deployment policies so we can build an inheritance model. So you have global policy that are inherited by all the workloads. And then we can have application specific security policies as well based on the classification of the application. It could be highly sensitive or moderate. Um, so, but again, there's, this is continuous work, right? Um, because 
imagine in a regulated environment, um, auditors tomorrow, rather than having these paper data calls, right, where you have to provide spreadsheets and spreadsheets of answers, all they have to get is an output of a report from your policy enforcement points. So mm -hmm. that makes life for the developers as well as the organizations much easier and the auditors very easy to see where the violations are and where the focus needs to be in terms of improving security. And actually on that focus point, Jaya, I, what I'm hearing is this is a bit of a culture evolution or a mashup maybe of kind of old and new culture where you've, you've got to be thinking about continuous uh, policy implementation, policy maintenance, but yet you have to you know, integrate that with existing IT and, and existing control structures. What, 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 what do you see and how you approach this? Yeah, that's an excellent point. I think, um, I think that's why I feel like uh, two things. One is if I look at customers, right, they don't just have one cluster that they're managing. Typically it is a fleet of clusters, right? And like Aradhana was saying, you know, some fleet, some set of clusters are dedicated to certain application teams, et cetera, right? So really what we are looking for is you need a policy management that is multi-cluster and it is oriented toward uh, splitting those clusters into different application teams and having a policy specific for those uh, aspects, right? And that said, I think uh, we also need to think about existing IT operational processes and tools that customers are using today. Um, that they use, for example, to prepare for audits, to make sure that the, of their security posture, day-to-day, -day, how they action incidents, et cetera, right? So this is where I think combining the policy management or policy-based governance with the existing IT operational processes. I think really that um, I'm using the term automated governance to refer to that, which is to say, you know, customers are already automating things. Now, if we can add the element of governance to it through policies, then we can basically say, um, here are your best practices. They're represented as policies. Here are violations you can detect using this uh, system. And now you can trigger the, your existing automations to fix those violations, right? So you close the loop, right? So I think that's really where we are headed. So multi-cluster multi automated governance is the way to go in my view. And, and Jim, you know, again, developers and, and DevOps folks who come to you and, and who are interacting with Caverno and the community, uh, they have to kind of build a business case, even if it's in the open source world, they have to mm -hmm. focus time and attention. Is that, is that argument about automation across governance, across controls, is that the argument they're using? Are there other arguments that are effective in, you know, getting their teams excited about this, getting their, their management right. excited about this? Yeah, so what we're seeing is a strong push towards policy-based operations, right? So if you look at Kubernetes today, and of course, control planes, um, we know that most enterprises tend to be you know, hybrid cloud or hybrid multi-cloud. Um, control planes are you know, being run on public cloud, private cloud, edge data centers, things like that. So as you know, Jaya was also pointing out, if you need central management across all of these clusters, um, what's really needed is autonomy across these dev and ops roles, but you need strong alignment and policies become the, the way to do that. So really operational efficiencies becomes the very, very much in Kubernetes, uh, the first reason why policy management becomes uh, critical. And then of course, securing Kubernetes and making it secure by default, like Aradna was pointing out becomes uh, another leading reason, which is equally, if not more important. And, and then, you know, we, we hear about use cases around compliance and uh, governance and other mappings, right? So those are the sort of hierarchy of needs, if you will, if we see, uh, starting with, you know, the basic is, look, Kubernetes is complex, make it easy. All right, we solved that. Now, is it secure? And how do we make sure all of our clusters are secure by default? and we eliminate all these manual steps. And then what else can we do with it? Can we get to that push button compliance reporting, that push button uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of governance integration with that complete feedback loop through policy as code best practices? Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to open this up to all of you. Uh, Radnell, I'll start with you. So how do I know that I'm doing this correctly, that, it, uh, that I'm implementing this and managing this well over time? So in my opinion, I think you have to improve this iteratively. On the day one, you're not going to have a full repository of all the policies, right? Policies as you learn. I mean, of course, there are best practices out there that can be converted into policies as a starting point. But from there, it has to be continuous loop of feedback from the intelligence that you get and you continue to improve and harden your policies from there. Um, and maturity is built over time, um, obviously, because um, again, the thread landscape is gonna change. There's gonna be evolution of all the policies over time um, and slowly from one cluster to multi-cluster and cross cloud clusters, uh, obviously. And uh, with solutions like Anthos and EKS on-prem, um, you're gonna have hybrid clusters out there as well. Jaya, same question to you. How do you define success? Yeah, so I think um, one, one uh, additional angle I wanted to add here is uh, we talked a lot about policies for security and compliance. There are also policies for resiliency and policies for software engineering standards, right? Those are important as well. So I think um, the reason I wanted to mention that is as, as an example, right? Let's say that you have a policy for resource limits or a policy for liveness projects, things like that. These are things that um, you want to kind of catch early that an application developer is thinking about these things upfront rather than, you know, they're not thinking about it and then it becoming a crisis, right? Because you're running out of resources on your cluster, you know, then they are called over the weekend or late in the night saying your application is, you know, failing or whatever, right? So, so I, th I think this is where I feel like um, the policy management aspects span those kind of criteria as well, right? And I think, um, so that's one point I wanted to convey. The other thing is, uh, as Aradhan was talking about, right? Um, when you first start, you do have to make some investment because you're going to put this uh, architecture in place, right? And so you won't get the benefits right away. But um, once you have it in place, then you will kind of see that uh, your operations team is kind of having a view of things on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, they're not scrambling then to get ready for an audit. Right, it is a continuous process. Right, so it does, uh, like Robert, you were saying, it does require a uh, change in culture, right, um, of how uh, IT operates. But it does have benefits because you can kind of manage on how things are configured. How do I action them? You know, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And then, to the people who are listening to this uh, panel. This is more a call for participation into our community, right? Which is, we do have to build out a library of policies. So the, the concepts that we have in our white paper talks about you know, various control areas and you know, aspects, but we need to really build out that library based on various policy engines that are out there, like you want our gatekeeper, et cetera, right? So I think um, this is where I think the community participation in that to actually make this real, is going to be extremely important um, because like I said, you know, you need this enabled for all controls across all layers of the stack. So to get the full benefits. And, and Jim, same question, but a little twist, anything that you think that the community developers need to enable to make this success more efficient or more possible? Yeah, so certainly to me, success would be, you know, happy developers uh, and happy security and operations team uh, means successful business, right? That's a lofty goal. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so getting to that point and, you know, making this so seamless, so easy where it really seems like a nice productive experience without, um, you know, worrying about the complexity, worrying about the security posture and things like that. But yeah, to your to the specific question in terms of what else can be done in the community, so that the you know the power of Kubernetes is its extensibility, and that's where using native tools, using native you know policy as code best practices, and really embracing Kubernetes as a platform for building platforms, uh, I, I think there's more that can be done there. Some of the things beyond what Jaya just mentioned, what we're also doing. Um, you need, the community is also starting to look, and this is the broader Kubernetes community in general and the CNCF, um, is how do you make sure 
these admission controllers themselves are secured uh, as well as protected, right? What are the right controls uh, to have in uh, place as you're looking at the different layers of your cloud security model? So certainly there's a lot of good ongoing work and I think this is pushing and supply chain is another area where uh, admission controllers are also playing a critical role. So all of this is really you know, pushing the awareness uh, as well as the increased sort of improvedness uh, of the security posture overall. And then uh, to close it up before we take questions, uh, 10 seconds each, Aradna, make some predictions. What are gonna be the biggest challenges or the biggest wins, the big, biggest successes in this space over the next 12 months? I think in the multi-cloud, hybrid um, deployments where you have portability of applications from one cluster to another. I think policy management brings a big value because you can deploy at one place and then distribute wherever you want it to be. Daya, your predictions? Yeah, my prediction is though this requires a change in culture, I'm kind of seeing that change happening. So, so I'm optimistic that uh, we will have uh, like I can dream big, right? So uh, I'm hoping that we will get to a point where we have a library that says, okay, if you if you deploy this library of policies, um, then your cluster is ready for this particular compliance standard, right? For the technical controls, I think that's that's kind of would be a nice goal to achieve, and uh, I feel like uh, the time has come to do that. Go big or go home, <laughs> Jim. Your prediction. Yeah, along similar lines, right? So just uh, automation, 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 and being secure by default. Fantastic. My, my prediction is we're going to grow the policy work group community. We're going to have more participants on our Wednesday calls. Our white paper is going to be a success. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for joining in this conversation. It's been fantastic and very thought provoking. And then I think we now have questions on the virtual platform. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Robert.